Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Sue Perkins and in the news this week. After rigorous analysis of the latest figures, the world's leading economist gives his forecast for Britain's growth over the next ten years. <laughs> At St Mary's Hospital, as he arrives for his annual checkup, there's embarrassment for one patient as a film crew spots him with his stool sample. <laughs> <laughs> and after successfully walking in a straight line to convince the police he's sober, one drink driver gives the game away as he gets back into his car. <laughs> Must remember to try that. With Ian is a comedian and actor for whom things are going pretty well at the moment. Because it's only a few more sleeps until Christmas and he's been a very good boy this year. <laughs> Please welcome the unfeasibly young and beautiful Jack Whitehall. <laughs> With Paul is the new host of Countdown, who previously worked for 21 years for Amstrad, making him the only man who thinks the countdown clock is advanced technology. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Nick Hewer. <laughs> and we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Jack, take a look at this. This is Britain alone. Is there a snub coming? It's a, a big, big story. It's finding a, a solution to the euro crisis that's nick clegg he was on the andrew marsh show he said that under no circumstances he'd go on and then <laughs> did <laughs> <laughs> they said they were going to come to a deal and then they didn't this and is... we managed to veto it yes we did that's it yes we we, we david cameron uh, used the british veto uh, during the euro crisis summit does anyone know how the sun portrayed the pm on its front page on saturday was it Churchill, but without a cigar? Without a cigar. Because you're not allowed to smoke now. No. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> there was an indication of the increasingly frosty relations between Britain and France uh, in the body language. I didn't see it, but I read about a missed handshake opportunity. Is that the one? But that's, that's not what you do. The, the missed handshake now, because of John Terry, means that it means you've done someone's missus. <laughs> because, no, Wayne Bridge didn't shake John Terry's hand Are you famously, and therefore that... Mr. Cameron has had an affair with Carla Bruni. If he has had a go on Carla Bruni, <laughs> for once in my life, respect. <laughs> had a go on. Had a go on. <laughs> Sorry, had a go with. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Let's have a look at the body language that was used. Uh -huh. Here they are. Sarkozy saying hello to uh, Pat Butcher there, who he's massive. <laughs> <laughs> She just got told. It wasn't just body language, was it? Sarkozy said that Camera behaved like a, a petulant kid or an obstinate kid. Mm. He's a rude little man, Sarko, and he's so pleased with himself now to have achieved that. Mm. He can look at the French people square in the face and say, there you go, that's the sort of chap I am. Yeah. Is it wrong to say Sarkozy finds it quite hard to look anybody in the face? Puts <laughs> <laughs> him square in the knee. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, a lot of Europe was fed up with Britain after the summit. What did German MP Alexander Graf Lambsdorff have to say about the round. This time we win. <laughs> <laughs> he said it was a mistake to admit the British into the European <laughs> Union. Which is a bit unfair. After all, invading Poland wasn't such a brilliant idea. But you don't bang on about it, do you? <laughs> yes, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, how was Cameron referred to by one French diplomat? You've mentioned, obviously, that Sarkozy said he was an obstinate kid. I don't know what that is in French. The obstinate kid. <laughs> <laughs> I bow to your greater linguistic skills. <laughs> I'm teaching the language course at the moment. Yeah. Very easy. It's so far, we've got French and German. It's very impressive. It is, it's very easy. It's very yeah. impressive. A man who goes to a wife swapping oh, yes. party without taking his wife. <laughs> That's a classic yeah, French I've... insult, isn't it? <laughs> and also, I've tried that. They don't even let you in the door. No. <laughs> it's a definition of optimism, really, isn't it? Attending a wife swapping party? Without a wife. You you been to lots of those, Nick? <laughs> no, I'm That's having... how we met, isn't it? I'm, we... <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a little stab at it, though. It is I an optimistic that as well. thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we know 
what Cameron said when, when this was hailed at him? What, grow I, up? Well, no, he said, I have not and have no plans to... <laughs> yeah. ..to attend any wife-swapping party. He's so non-European, isn't he, Cameron? <laughs> I think that we're going to see our Prime Minister creeping back to Europe for a quiet chat to see what he can't get back in, really. Do you think so? I think so. And furthermore, I've got a little shed in France and I don't want them to burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> When you say shed, do you mean... I think your garden. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've also got... <laughs> I've also got dual nationality. There'll be an Irish trickler flying in my garden. Yeah, I'm half Irish. Do you have an Irish passport? No, I don't, no. Travel on an Irish passport. It's you much easier, isn't it? welcome everywhere. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I might get one. Get one. Mm. <laughs> I'll be back well, in about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> So, Friday morning, go through the chronology of this. Friday, yeah, Friday morning, morning, Nick, Nick Clegg, Clegg yeah, gets a call. And says, um, yes, there was no other option, we had to use the veto. By Sunday, he's bitterly disappointed. <laughs> yeah. What's happened in that three days? So, we should hear from the horse's mouth. Um, yeah, this is it. Nick Clegg talking to Andrew Marr about that fated incident. Can I ask you, during those nine hours of negotiation late into the night, at any point did the Prime Minister call you and speak to you about it directly? I spoke to the Prime Minister after the summit was concluded, of course. So, so, just... so not during the negotiations well, of course themselves? Not. He, was, he was locked in a, in a nocturnal negotiation. I was, uh, I was locked in my flat in so Sheffield. <laughs> so this is, he's been locked in his flat in Sheffield. But in case we're worried as to exactly what happened, thankfully, Channel 4 News staged a reconstruction <laughs> of what happened that evening. Fantastic. Early that morning, Mr Clegg was in his Sheffield constituency. <laughs> he had approved the government's <laughs> negotiating position for the European summit. <laughs> but at 4am, he was woken by a call from Brussels. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so somebody said, oh, we've, got, we've got an actor, but he doesn't look anything like Nick Clegg. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> what a cheat over his head and let the foot do the acting. <laughs> yeah. Do we know who was Cameron's role model throughout these EU negotiations? Enoch Powell. <laughs> it was Enoch Powell that suggested or thought that if you had sort of, if you spoke with a full bladder dying to go, that this gave some sort of your words a sense of urgency. Mm. Um, and apparently Cameron did this, was, was at a full bladder while he was negotiating, he was desperate to go to the loo. It's true that Enoch Powell actually said you should do nothing to decrease the tension before making a big speech. If anything, you should seek to increase it. That was in his famous Rivers of Piss speech. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's his name? A chap who fibbed over the um, dossier. Uh, Alistair, Alistair Campbell. Yeah. He pricked himself with an open That's right. uh, paper clip all during his examination yeah. at the uh, Leveson inquiry. That's it? right, yes. To keep him on edge. That's right. Well, really? it's a different really? technique, but what, yes. Well, I picked it up from the film The Ipcris File, where Michael Caine does a similar thing with a piece of broken glass to stop himself being hypnotised. Mind you, that, that was, uh, you know, uh, a film. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fiction, my lad. Yeah, well, so is Alistair Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Monday, yeah. Nick, so we've done Friday all through the weekend. Yep. Now he's changed his mind. Nick Clegg goes missing when Cameron comes to the Commons to defend his decision. Why was that? Well, well I thought that was really unfair that people were saying, oh, yeah, Nick Clegg wasn't in the House of Commons. But it's fair enough, you know, David Cameron's dry cleaning won't pick itself up. <laughs> He said he didn't turn up because he thought it would be a distraction. Yes. And that everyone might laugh at him. Yes. Mm. Which, again, is one of the few things he got right. But he's not a distraction as well. Is Nick Clegg? Like, I mean, if David Cameron turned up with Rihanna, yeah, I'd probably be looking at Rihanna. <laughs> but Nick Clegg could turn up to the House of Commons, like, completely naked, save for a lit flare in front of his manhood, and I still wouldn't, like, even know who he was. <laughs> but you'd never forget him, though, would no, you? No, <laughs> So, Ed Miliband tries to put Cameron on the spot in the Commons, and at one point, oh, Miliband yes. told the Speaker, I haven't finished with him yet. Yes. How did Cameron Osborne react to this threat? Did they go, ooh? <laughs> <laughs> Made those sort of noises? Yeah. I love how childish it is, like, I mean, all of it. Like, A, that he wouldn't go and sit next to him, and then an insult like that. That's, like, mm. one save away from saying, your mum is so fat, her BMI number is pie. Like... <laughs> You're not writing his speeches, are you? 
<laughs> it's the Jeffrey Howe sort of argument again, isn't it? Being beaten with a dead sheep. I mean, mm. an attack by Miliband is, you know, a dead mouse probably. Really? really? Yeah. Have you met uh, Miliband? I have. Oh. Tall, arrogant, weak handshake. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a Labour voter. Would you have voted for his brother, then? Would you prefer the brother? I didn't meet the brother, but I met some of the others. Oh, dear. <laughs> I met uh, Diane Abbott, <laughs> did yeah. a little bit of lightweight TV researching for Palamine. He said she was terrible. Uh, there was the bully. What's his name? Ed, Ed Balls. Balls. <laughs> you wouldn't pay him in washers. No. <laughs> So you met all the, all the Labour candidates. Did they bring you in to vet them all? No. Were you given power Over of Over the veto? years I'd met... I, I, I've never met Burnham. Is it Burnham? Burnham. Burnham. Andy, Andy Burnham. Burnham. I don't know who he is. <laughs> um, I'm afraid we need a new raft of them, because that, um, you know, they're dead in the water. Is your main criteria for leadership a strong handshake? Yeah. You'd vote I Abu think, Hamza. No, I mean, I'm being... I'm being <laughs> Serious. That's a very strong handshake. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Draw yeah. blood. You know somebody if they've got it. Yeah. And he ain't got it. No. Right. So, so have you seen anyone who has got it on the contemporary scene? No. That's the tragedy. <laughs> what about Little Mix? <laughs> <laughs> so the Daily Mail have accused the BBC of not uh, being impartial, and the Mail's impartial lead story on the front page of their paper that same day ran as follows. Nick Clegg became the incredible sulk of British politics <laughs> yesterday by snubbing David Cameron's triumphant appearance in the Commons. Daily Mail must be... I, you know, that's why they're writing stuff like that, because they must feel really weird at the moment, because there's nothing to hate about. I mean, like, there's all this anti-European stuff going around. They don't know what to do. Jan Moyers probably sat at her desk praying that Elton John dies in suspicious circumstances. <laughs> to die. She'll manufacture yeah. circumstances. <laughs> One thing's for sure, come Eurovision Song Contest, we're screwed, aren't we? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they hated us as it was, and now we could resurrect the Beatles and send them, we'd still get Neil Poin. <laughs> Is that such a bad thing? <laughs> I do like the Eurovision Song Contest. I do get quite annoyed, because they always say it's political as well, politically motivated, yes. and now it'll get even more so. So I reckon we just go tough on them. We said, like, Moldova, like, oh, we're only sending you two points this year. Well, fine, we're sending you two of them Tomahawk missiles. <laughs> <laughs> Just as soon as we found out where the hell you are. <laughs> I went to Moldova once. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moldova is the place where the Terraline Eiderdown that slips off the bed yeah. still exists. Right. You know those terrible things? Yeah. I thought you'd you put be the eye down on and it goes yeah. straight onto the floor. Even that doesn't want to be there. No. <laughs> Politics and normal goes on, of course. We catch up with Adam Werity. Do you remember Adam Werity? He was Dr Fox's friend. There he is. He gave an interview to The Spectator this week and, amongst other things, we found out what his plans are for New Year's Eve. So he's going to spend it with the foxes? <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah. No, he's no, forgiving. Yeah. Is he a friend of Dr Fox's, like... Um, William Hague had that friend. <laughs> you should have a chat with our lawyer about that one. Yeah. <laughs> what do you spell innuendo? You're doing countdown, you should brush up on these things. Oh. <laughs> Don't talk to me about that. Mike. No, well, well, have you done well? You would... I see all these letters. Yeah. I thought, oh my god. And I, 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 I get cat. <laughs> yes. And then, and then some kid yeah. says, cataclysmic. Yeah. It's only nine letters, isn't it? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> yes, he is indeed. Paul, you're right. He's going to be round at the Foxes. It's just staggering how naive some of these senior politicians can be. You know? mm. Staggering. <laughs> and then Cameron brings in Coulson into number ten. Sort of bloke you wouldn't have in the house. <laughs> If you saw him come up the drive, you I'd be on the curtains, wouldn't you? <laughs> You'd set the dog on him. Yeah. <laughs> Samantha Cameron was spotted shopping this week. Um, does anyone know where she went to make her purchases? She went to Ikea. This was an austerity bid, wasn't it? Because she bought some flat packs and 
I think we're meant to believe they go home and her and David lay them all out and then count the number of um, screws and some say, look, there's one missing there. <laughs> there's pictures of her. She's posed, in fact. It was a set-up. Of course. Because they've just spent 80,000 quid on the curtains or something and somebody said, look, get down to Ikea <laughs> and make it look as though yeah. you're like the rest of us. Yeah. You're so cynical, Nick. <laughs> No, it's because... You're going to tell us some of those apprentices are really quite good. They are. <laughs> but did you notice... They're it? not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll die for them. Yeah. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> Is it because, um, as well, Sweden's one of the few countries that are sort of with us, with this whole sort of anti-Europe thing. Mm. So they're trying to keep them sweet, going to Ikea, buying up a bit of that. Yeah. Thinking. Thinking ahead. Never. Twelve no. points coming yeah. our way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. On a positive note, this is what Andrew Neil was doing on his politics show this week. Uh, we leave you with news that the music for the 2012 opening ceremony will be overseen by a techno rave outfit called Underworld, who famously provided the soundtrack to train, train spotting. Remember that? That was a gutter story of illegal drug taking on an Olympic scale. Nighty night. <laughs> Don't let the performance enhancing substances bite. <laughs> Nurse, nurse. <laughs> My wife used to go out with him. <laughs> What? She oh. did. She really did. Yeah, when they were kids, yeah. She said he was good-looking in those days. <laughs> Jack, do you find a lot of kids busting out some of those moves at the clubs? Oh, yeah, that one. That's a classic. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always doing that yeah. down the clubs. <laughs> and what's this one about? Um, Are you making some sort of pudding? <laughs> you're, you're mixing the... Uh, yes, mixing. Yeah. No, 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 mixing the discs. Oh, You're right. playing the tracks, you know? Mm. Hip hop, R&B. Excellent. What's this then? Um, that's if you're hard of hearing. Oh, right. <laughs> this is David Cameron's uh, Christmas bonus for the bankers with his brave refusal to allow Europe to make them pay for the mess they've caused. Not that we're taking sides. <laughs> After that, Nick Clegg's conspicuous absence in the House of Commons, David Cameron replied, I'm not responsible for his whereabouts. I should never have let him off the lead. It's only a matter of time before there's a YouTube video of Cameron in Richmond Park shouting, Cleggy! Cleggy! Jesus Christ! Cleggy! <laughs> Party leaders sent out their Christmas cards this week. Nick oh, Clegg's yeah. cards depicted himself as a snowman. An appropriate choice, as he won't last beyond January either. <laughs> well, Nick, take a look at this. Ah, oh, scandalous. These are glove puppets we're looking at there. <laughs> um, no, like, they, those are small children inside. Uh, there's the, the remarkable and lovely David Attenborough with a, a, a bee on his finger, probably. That's a bogey. Is it? <laughs> I mean, when you said that, the Director General of the BBC came up. Was that deliberate? <laughs> what happened was that uh, they, you know, impossible to get footage of sort of newly born cubs in the den with the polar bear because the polar bear would, would kill the cameraman or would kill the cubs. So what they did was they had a shot of uh, uh, polar bear and, and some uh, cubs in a specially built sort of shells that had been built in a, in a Dutch sort of wildlife park and they used that material and some people said they felt cheated by this. But there are 32 people, in the age of Twitter, 32 people complained <laughs> out of 8 million that watched Frozen Planet and yeah. one of them complained was the polar bear, said, oh, you're nowhere near me, I didn't see any cameras. The last thing you want to do is to sneak up on a polar bear mm. with its cubs. No. Yeah. I've seen well, I think human like, women, when they're giving birth, get pretty annoyed. A polar bear, yeah. I imagine, would be apoplectic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was a bit disappointed. He said afterwards, hey, we're making movies, guys. And I thought, no, you're not. You're making a documentary. And the point of that is you think, wow, they've gone to the wild and filmed that. If I found out that that crocodile had jumped up and attacked the wildebeest crossing the river, and they said, oh, that was in Scunthorpe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we did that in a zoo. But, but you wouldn't be disappointed to find that it happened in Scunthorpe. You'd be intrigued. No, I'd be thrilled, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that Nick Clegg 
the Nick Clegg thing there, yeah. which I believe totally. Yeah. I thought he was in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the phone was going. <laughs> um, and I would have been disappointed, but luckily they put reconstruction yes. <laughs> at the bottom. Makes you wonder about the moon landings, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> I'm with Mr. Merton. Oh, are you? Yeah, I know you are. You're sitting over there. Not <laughs> me. Because my wife comes from Scunthorpe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's where she met Andrew Neil in a wildlife park, <laughs> wasn't it? This is the piece of footage that we're arguing over. Yes. But on these side slopes, beneath the snow, new lives are beginning. The cubs are born blind and tiny. An early birth is easier on the mother, who is barely awake. And in the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a polar bear. Polar bear's a polar bear. People are reacting like they've talked a cat. <laughs> it's not a big deal, but he did no. say on these slopes exactly. beneath the ice. That's what you would see you if you were there. Well, he could have said, this is what you would have seen. I know I'm, I'm making a less interesting yes. documentary oh. in my head. Yes. Well, you'll be, at least you're watching it, anyway. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so, five years ago, Sir David Attenborough was voted Britain's what? Most trusted man. Exactly. Yeah. He was. Yes, which is odd, because as we now know, he's a pathological liar. <laughs> uh, one online commentator has said this, this to the BBC. Yes. If Attenborough admitted he was secretly collecting the baby polar bears to make soup, I'd find a way of forgiving him. <laughs> we know what the polar bears involved in the scandal are up to now. Well, they've got a few adverts. Glacier's mints, yeah, they're doing that. One. <laughs> uh, well, Huggies, the mother, she's had some more babies. One of the polar bear cubs in the programme has got his own show at a wildlife park in Inverness in Scotland. And um, the other cub's doing fine as well. <laughs> <laughs> David Attenborough made it into soup. <laughs> this delicious bear. <laughs> people love this as well, though, doing that stuff of accusing shows of being fake. Like, loads of people do it with The Only Way is Essex. And you see them all the time go, oh, it's scripted, it's scripted. It's not scripted. If it was scripted, it would mean the people in it would have to read. <laughs> You don't think Made in Chelsea's fake as well, do you? What? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. What else uh, in the animal kingdom have the BBC faked pictures of? Bagpuss on the safari. <laughs> oh, <I'm gonna> say <laughs> it. Think of the scariest animal in the world. Rasta mouse. <laughs> um, it's actually the, the Goliath tarantula. It's the size of a dinner plate. And, That's um, handy. The... <laughs> <laughs> what, what do they taste like? <laughs> in Human Planet, the BBC showed footage of Venezuelan boys hunting one, although, according to the mirror, some scenes were filmed in the UK. Deadliest animal on the planet is the human being. My teacher told me that once and said the deadliest weapon is the human mind, which I don't think is right. Stephen Hawkins is very clever, but you put him in a tank with a shark, my money's on the shark. <laughs> You've just given Channel 5 their next game show. <laughs> so what did Mark Thompson attribute uh, the newspaper fury about um, the pandas to? Well, he did have a point. He was saying this is revenge for Leveson, because the BBC's been saying, haven't the papers behaved badly, and they've been very keen to find something where the BBC's behaved badly. And kill two birds with one stone, because Hugh Grant is actually the father of the cub, so... <laughs> <laughs> I missed that bit of yeah. the evidence. <laughs> it was on the website. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, Mark Thompson did wonder whether this is really about polar bears or Lord Leveson. Back at the press inquiries, what was handed to the select committee inquiry into phone hacking? Was this the email no. to James Murdoch, mm. which he didn't read? Yes. He said he received it, mm. and it said, you know, there's more trouble here, there's loads of reporters hacking people, but he didn't get that far. Because no. when you're chief executive of a company and when the lawyer writes to you and says, you know, there's trouble everywhere, you don't read it. No. And it was the weekend, as he said. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Saturday. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, you come on, he can't work for seven days a week. Give the guy a break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think if he'd been in front of you on The Apprentice, he would have got anywhere. He's in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> squirmy, squirmy. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Even if he said he tried really hard to run the company properly, you, you wouldn't have it, would you? No. He's done for. <laughs> Did you notice the way that the Times reported that? Yeah, the Times is and quite And the keen. way that the Independent did it. So different. How interesting. Mm. <laughs> Actually, I'm slightly adrift because it was the mild care story that was reported so differently. Because yeah, the no, that story Times the Times actually did run. trumpeted the fact that it couldn't have been mild care, uh, deleting Millie Dowler's uh, um, voice messages because he wasn't brought onto the scene until afterwards. They had I'd... the phone. I mean, they're arguing about who's responsible for the messages falling off and whether yeah. they fell off automatically. But no-one seems to know. They got the phone company involved saying, did they, and no-one can remember. Company's gone bust, technology... I mean, he's older than Amstrad. Yeah. I know, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to get a very strongly worded fax about that. <laughs> I think the Levinson inquiry would be so much better if it was conducted by Nick and Alan Sugar and stuff. That would be so. Then we'll sat there, Nick giving the death stare eyes, that cold gaze, and then Alan Sugar wagging around the finger, shouting at them, and then finally Karen Brady could patronise them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit unfair. Mm. She's very sharp. He said, covering his ass. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the news that the BBC didn't send a cameraman into minus 60 degrees to poke a long pole with a camera attached into a polar bear den, thereby endangering their life and the lives of the newly born polar bears. Not that we're taking sides. The fakery row has damaged the reputation of the BBC, but that will be nothing compared to the scandal when ITV viewers find out those aren't real meerkats. <laughs> <laughs> also this week, the infamous News of the World reporter Maza Mahmood has been given evidence to the Leveson Inquiry. During his tabloid career, he entrapped dozens of celebrities by dressing up as a fake shake. In case you're wondering, he is still in work. Dressing up as a polar bear for BBC documentaries. <laughs> And so to round two, the Large Hadron Collider of news. In this round, we fire high-speed news particles at each other and analyse the results. Ooh. Buzz in when you know what it is. <laughs> OK, Paul and Nick. Well, that's the Hadron Collider. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> Yes, there's sort of... It's this uh, Higgs boson particle, isn't there, which they... they it's, I, don't, I don't understand it, not many, people, not many people do. But they're sort of, they've got an idea that it's in the vicinity. They're not sure exactly where it is, but they've got an idea, they, they know roughly where it is. So they're hoping it will emerge next year. In a flat in Sheffield? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I read that it was sort of millions of pounds worth of technology and cameras, loads of flashing lights, but all focused on microscopic potential. A bit like X Factor. <laughs> The Times says the scientists have had the strongest indication yet of the Higgs boson's existence. <laughs> what is yeah. the indication? What is it? Is it a disembodied voice they hear? I, I am the Higgs boson. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot find me. How <laughs> oh, is that just... Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> they do use a particular analogy. It's an analogy between Margaret Thatcher and the Higgs boson. I know I can see a horror there. This is used by scientists. And it says the universe is compared to a cocktail party attended by Margaret Thatcher. Her <laughs> popularity amongst Tories in 1993 means she has more mass than everyone in the room. This is obviously pre-Eric Pickles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> once she's moving, she's hard to stop. And once she's stopped, she's hard to get moving again. What happens next is a rumour is started and passes through the room. It would travel in clusters, giving those carrying the rumour extra mass and that, in essence, is the Higgs boson. I don't understand <laughs> it. I went to a party where she was once. Yeah. <laughs> was she carrying a lot of mass at the time? Carrying a big handbag. Yeah, that'll be it. <laughs> now, if you don't understand this, um, we've got Professor Steve Jones, who's one of the Telegraph's science correspondents, oh. and what he had to say on the subject of Higgs boson on Wednesday. Mm. I don't understand any of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's refreshing. It's reassuring, Prof. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, but don't worry, if you don't understand it, they've released some footage that will clear it all up. It's like trying to get out of Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, hope this, I hope this isn't a simulation we're watching here, because it uh, <laughs> hasn't indicated that it's not. Oh, look, that's real. That's oh, real. it's lovely. Ooh. Ooh, look at that. This is what would happen if Andrew Neil actually took ecstasy. <laughs> the beginning of Tron, but I'm yeah. none the wiser. I was chucked out of chemistry, or is it physics? 
I've no idea. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't do chemistry. I was terrible at that. I was, I was no good at that at all. I did, I, for some bizarre reason, I don't know why, I ended up doing chemistry A-level. God knows why. I managed to write, lime water turns milky three times and fell asleep. <laughs> I don't know why lime water turns milky, but under certain circumstances, you can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great coming out of the exam, because people were going, oh, I'm not sure how I did, and all that. I was completely gone. I knew how I'd done. <laughs> <laughs> No worries at all. <laughs> Elsewhere in science, what challenge will Professor Stephen Hawking be facing in the new year? Is he playing in the Olympic basketball team? <laughs> Fastest lap on Top Gear? <laughs> uh, Radio 4 has asked its listeners to submit some fiendish questions oh. put to Professor Stephen Hawking in its most cerebral quiz ever. So, uh, a lot of these questions can be seen online, but shall we have a go at answering just a couple of them? Yes, why not? If a car is being driven at speeds faster than light, would the headlights still work? <laughs> yes, it. yes. Yes. But they'd be behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things you just get to score if it takes a man five days to run a bath, how many apples and a bunch of grapes. I mean, I can never... <laughs> I don't know. Ask him, I don't know. Why bother me? <laughs> I don't know. If the universe is perpetually expanding, yeah. what's it expanding into? Eamon Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> or <wait> not. <laughs> Constel constellations are disappearing daily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the correct answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what what exam board do you represent again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and finally, what is the point of BBC researchers if I have to think of questions to ask you? <laughs> 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 Very succinctly. Fingers on Buzz's teams. Here's another one, Buzz, when you know what it is. <laughs> Mr Goodwin. Yes, it is Mr Goodwin. Mm -hmm. Has he had a leg removed for crimes against the state? <laughs> <laughs> You literally couldn't get a picture that made you look like more of a wanker. <laughs> wanker. The Financial Services Authority have produced a report on how Royal Bank of Scotland collapsed, and they've come to the conclusion that it was his fault. And he tried to buy a Dutch bank, and everyone said, don't buy the bank, because they've got real problems. And he said, no, I'm going to buy the bank. I think it'll work out well. And the rest of the, the, the <laughs> board said, good idea, Sir Fred. We'll do whatever you say and then take the cheque. Mm. And it went belly up. Uh, so the bank had to be bailed out uh, by us to the tune of 46 billion quid. 26,000 people were robbed of their jobs and helped bring the economy to its knees. Um, <laughs> the answer to all this recession stuff, of course, would be to ask your old mucker, Mr Sugar. Would it not, Nick? Lord Sugar. Lord Sugar. Do you think so? Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it's like countdown. Wake <laughs> up! <laughs> <laughs> Just because the audience is asleep yeah. doesn't mean you can be. <laughs> What a terrible thing rack. to say about the countdown audience. <laughs> Some of them are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the answer to all the recession uh, stuff would be to ask Nick's old boss, Lord Sugar. How does this region get out of recession? Oh, shit. You know, it's gonna say... <laughs> <laughs> That's when he was a government spokesman. Yeah. <laughs> he was meant to be helping small businesses. No. They caught him off guard and he wasn't feeling very well. But he came back and gave just a great, full explanation of what should have happened. How's that? Yeah. yeah. Pretty nauseating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, amongst the many people that were criticised in this report, Sir Fred Goodwin cops some flack. According to the Mirror, yeah. Sir Fred's style can only be described as brutal, uh, with the RBS executive wing known as the torture chamber, where Goodwin would hold morning beatings every day at 9.30am to intimidate and humiliate execs. Morning beatings? I think that's what they used to call morning meetings. They, the, the terrified employees would oh, say I they're see, morning right. meetings. So you didn't actually physically attack people every morning? No, I mean, he's, he's no. not Max Mosley, for goodness <laughs> sake. <laughs> You're flirting with danger, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> what do you know about him personally, his engagement with his employees? Oh, well, he had an affair with one of them. Yes. And then took out an injunction to try and stop anyone knowing. How did that go? <laughs> I think I may have just broken it. So what have, what have pink wafers got to do with all of this? For people who were employee of the month, he would make them eat <laughs> their own body weight in pink wafers in a dungeon. He would fire pink wafers at them through a pneumatic air pistol <laughs> into their gaping mouth, which had been held open by a specially trained monkey. <laughs> it's close. Yeah. It's close. <laughs> yeah, um, well, basically, Sir Fred once raged at catering staff 
in an email entitled Rogue Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> After senior executives were served pink wafers. I think he does have. Sli I don't want to, you know, agree with Fred the Shred Goodwin, but the pink wafer is a is a terribly tricky biscuit to handle. You can't eat it and not look really camp. And I struggle at, at the best of you times. You shouldn't to go try near the them. Don't go near them. I can't go <laughs> near a pink no, wafer, no. even if I'm dunking it in like a big milk yeah, of tea with yeah. 15 sugars. As soon as it comes out, it just the whole hand transforms. Yeah. I have to stick with something manly, like a bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather wear a tiara than eat yeah. a wing. Yeah. <laughs> well, tabloids particularly disappointed to learn wasn't relevant and pertinent to the inquiry. His affair. His affair, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, but the inquiry cleared just about everyone of everything. I tell you what, sugar would have got to the bottom of all this in That's double Lord quick time. Yeah. Lord Sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In other banking news, why has an investment banker named Mike had a bad week? Something to do with the internet in some way. Yes, that's right. He yeah. emailed somebody and somebody who shouldn't have got the email read it and then there was a huge kerfuffle and it ended up on YouTube. <laughs> I've got no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Well, Mike has basically gone viral, so you were right about the internet. Yes. Um, after he wrote a 1,615-word email to his date, Lauren, who refused to go on a second date with him. Um, according to the Mail, Lauren was so appalled by the point-by-point -point reasons as to how she supposedly led Mike on that she posted the email on the internet. So, what examples did Mike give in his email to suggest that he felt led on and... Don't know, and... but I'm almost certainly going to be on his side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Men generally think that any, if a woman just looks at them, they think that that's it, mm. you know. They're, 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 we're quite simple creatures, really, in that, re in that regard. If their pupils dilate... That's right. How close are you? Yeah. <laughs> and what have you given them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no hit, no. <laughs> uh, Mike wrote, you played with your hair a lot. A woman playing with her hair is a sure sign of flirtation. You could even do a Google search on it. Unless his armpit hair, that's a way of getting rid of him. <laughs> he also says, we had lots of eye contact during our date. On a per minute basis, I've never had as much eye contact during a date as I did with you. You said it was nice to meet you at the end of our date. <laughs> yeah, how do we suggest that Mike um, carries things on in this situation? I think probably get out now. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> he's, he's not taken that hint. He's, oh. he's written, I suggest we continue to go out and see what happens. Needless to say, I find you less appealing now, <laughs> given that you haven't returned my messages, than I did at our first date. However, I would be willing to go out with you again. <laughs> he's not very good at hard to get, is he? <laughs> well, this is the FSA's report into the collapse of RBS. That was the report. No. <laughs> <laughs> they really took yeah. you off the ball, didn't yeah. they? <laughs> attention to what was coming through on the photocopier. No. They just... It's very bad. Yeah, very All bad. All this disguise, that's Sir Fred, <laughs> isn't it? Sir <laughs> <laughs> Fred is recently separated from his wife and, according to the Daily Mail, lives in a granny flat. Presumably, having sold his granny first. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words Round, which this week features as its guest publication, In a Nutshell, the official magazine of the Squirrel Lovers Club. Like squirrels themselves, it's not often read. <laughs> <laughs> It's the festive like that. season. That's a good squirrel joke. Yeah. There aren't many in the world. We start with to what or not to what? That is the question. To be or not to be a squirrel? That is the question. <laughs> to, to have my grandparents for Christmas or not to put up with racism for the next ten days? <laughs> it's the classic Yuletide dilemma. Yeah. Is that true of your grandparents? Yeah. <laughs> The answer is to feed or not to feed squirrels peanuts? That is the question. Mm. This is the fierce debate raging amongst squirrel lovers currently mm. coursing through the pages of In a Nutshell uh, over the best way to feed the cute-looking bushy-tailed roadkill. The same issue also features the following front-page apology. Apologies to William Bernstein, author of Nest Vigil, who never feeds squirrels peanuts, as was erroneously stated in our last issue. <laughs> Mr Bernstein only feeds squirrels Premium walnuts and pecans. <laughs> and that, news of the world, is how you do an apology. <laughs> <laughs> Next, seriously, people, when was the last time you saw a squirrel what? Give a damn. <laughs> Play tribute to the early jazz pioneer Bix Beiderbeck. <laughs> the answer is water ski behind a remote-controlled boat. This is the star columnist of In a Nutshell, Janet George, writing about Twiggy, the performing squirrel. Janet also reveals... 
It's rare for me to step outside without having a squirrel stalk me for a nut. It's the highlight of my day. She needs to stay in more. <laughs> Next, chuck, chuck, chuff, chuff, chuck. Is squirrel for what? There's a train coming. <laughs> it's actually anyone who thinks we're just rats with nicer outfits, think again. <laughs> and of course, chuck, chuck, chuff, chuff, chuck is also Cilla Black after the blind date reunion party. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, I what? Then the next thing I knew, there was a tree in bed with me. I shoved an acorn up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> was asleep. I was asleep. So we know the weather's been pretty stormy this week. Here's a response from Scotland. Oh, Lord. Oh my God! Trampoline! Trampoline! <laughs> <laughs> scores are Paul and Nick have four points but Ian and Jack have five I leave you with news that as the fun fair comes to Mogadishu it's a productive day on the rifle range for two Somali pirates <laughs> <laughs> unions brace themselves as number 10 unveils a new advisor with responsibility for work and pensions reform <laughs> and as an inquiry is set up to investigate alleged faking of BBC wildlife documentaries, one key witness agrees to testify as long as she's granted anonymity. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>